Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. So before we get into the message today, I want to address something because I know it's going to come up eventually, if not this week, in weeks to come. Why in the world have we gone back to two services? It was so nice during the summer to all be together as one big family, and uh, it, was just, it was just amazing. And it was. It is so awesome. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, we on the staff and as the leadership of the church and the board and whatnot, we have been praying that God would grow our church. Why do we want to grow? Well, if you think it's about anything to do with ego, you're absolutely wrong. If we grow as a church, it means more work for those of us who serve here as staff. And it's not that we uh, don't mind that, because I mean, I'm, some of you may remember from last week, I talked about the fact that God's blessings complicate our lives. And I'm okay. God, complicate our lives away. Send us more people. May we reach people for you. If you look around, it doesn't take very long to realize there are so many people in our city, in Brampton, who need Jesus. That's why we want to grow. That's why we want to see more come and be a part of this church family and be discipled here. And so we've gone back to two services uh, because we really think God is going to bless us in this coming year. Some of you might be familiar with the old story about the two farmers in a time of drought. And both farmers prayed, God send the rain. God send the rain. One farmer went out and prepared his fields. The other farmer sat at home and didn't do anything. Which one had the faith that God was going to bless? See, and I think that's where we are as a leadership in this church. We believe God is going to bless. And so we've gone back to two services. So we have enough room that as that blessing is unfolded, they have places, people have places to come and be a part of this church family. Uh, I know that this, the first service this uh, this past Sunday, like right now, like earlier today, had some amazing Sunday school classes being taught in them that some of you were a part of. And uh, we, we now have multiple youth Sunday school classes as well. And we're just like, we want to see people grow. We want to see them disciple and grow up in faith. So that is why we have gone back to two services, just in case you were wondering. Now you have way more information than you ever asked for, but now you know. So there we go. So I want to head into the message today, and I wonder if you've ever found it hard to pray. I mean, there's a desire to pray, and in fact, there is a ton of good intentions inside of you, and you even set time aside to go do that, to go spend time in prayer. And you start with enthusiasm for the first minute or so, and then your mind begins to wander. You begin to think about all that you have to do during the day, or you hear your children, or worse yet, you don't hear them, and begin to wonder what they're up to. Maybe, maybe it's the dog barking at the back door wanting in, or a thought goes through your head, did I leave the stove on? You know, and, and we're trying to stay in that time of prayer, focused, and then you hear the ding of your phone. You want to ignore it. You really do. But you've been conditioned, like Pavlo's dog. You, 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 you have to look, and you feel that pulling at you. You don't want to. But, and you begin to think, well, it might be important. Someone may be in trouble, like your aging parents. Or maybe, maybe, maybe someone has a prayer request. Yeah, that's it. That's the ticket. And so you go, and you look. Distractions. During prayer, when you're trying to pray, Distractions are everywhere, and they are external, and they are internal. Or maybe for you, every time you go to pray, the battle is not falling asleep. You've had some of your best naps that started with prayer. And you wonder, do I get credit for that? Like extended prayer time? Spending time in prayer can be hard for many of you even frustrating. It's almost like there's someone fighting against us, someone not wanting us to pray. But why would that be? Well, because there is power in prayer. 
In my grandparents' home, there hung a picture that said, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. So if you want to change the world, it starts with prayer. And a part of the wonder of prayer is that as you pray, it will change you. It will change you. Why pray? Well, it will change you, and it will change the world around you. And if we truly come to understand that, and we actually believe it, prayer will be central in our lives. You know, as we head into this today, and uh, the coming weeks that I'm going to be preaching once I get back, uh, we're going to do this little series on prayer. And I want you to know some of the books that have had an influence on the sermon today and those that are coming. Because I've been reading about prayer. Uh, Transforming Prayer by Daniel Henderson is one of the books. Uh, the Circle Maker by Mark Batterson uh, is another one of the books. And that's, those two books are newer. But there's also The Problem with Prayer is dot, 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 by David Hub, Hubbrand. That book is from the 70s. A Guide to Prayer by Reuben Job and Norman Schwachuk, what was written in 1983. And then there is A Life of Prayer by St. Teresa of Avila, who lived 1515 to 1582. And this is one of those books that I have come back to again and again over the years. For the same reason that I have some commentaries that I just love that were actually written between 1890 and 1910. People thought differently back then. And some of the insights that they have and some of the insights they gained are actually amazing. So following next week, so this coming Sunday, uh, Pastor Sean is going to be preaching for the next two weeks. And I know that is going to be awesome. Um, and then when I get back, because I'm heading with a couple of my girls to Montana to see our first grandchild, as she's born. She's not born yet, but she's coming. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Bonnie's flying out early because uh, Erin wants her with her, uh, which mom is thrilled about. And uh, then we're going to be driving out later on to uh, see them later on this week. And so Sean will be preaching the two weeks that I'm away, but when I get back, we're going to come back to this series on prayer and be in it for a few weeks. So before we go any further today, uh, let me just say a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for all that you are to us. And Father, this morning, I just want to pray and ask that you would just send your Holy Spirit amongst us with power. Lord, Holy Spirit, we want you here. We want you to work. Lord, I know that you're already here because you inhabit the praise of your people. But Lord, would you come with power? Your presence is something we can be assured of, but Lord, we want to we want to know you're here today. So would you allow us just to sense your presence? And Father, I want to pray that you would open up the hearts and the minds of my family today to hear what you want them to hear. God, would you work there? Lord, I pray that you will challenge and that you will encourage. Lord, and I ask in Jesus' name that you would forgive me my sins and cleanse me and Holy Spirit, even now, come fill me up in Jesus' name. Help me preach this message for your glory. Amen. So we're going to be spending some time today in Joshua chapter 5 and 6. That is in the Old Testament. And Joshua was the leader who followed Moses uh, with the people of Israel, the Jewish nation. Now, there is a city, the city of Jericho, and it was the first major obstacle for the people of Israel as they began their quest to take the promised land. It was the guard at the gate to the promised land, if you will. And for that time, it was a very formidable city. I did a little research this week on the walls that surrounded Jericho. So Jericho was surrounded by a great earthen fortification or embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base. Now, the retaining wall was some four to five meters, 12 to 15 feet high, and it was uh, a couple feet, it was uh, many feet thick. On top of that was a mud brick wall, two meters, six feet thick, 
and six to eight meters high. At the crest of the embankment was a similar mud brick wall whose base was roughly 14 meters above the ground level outside the retaining wall. And you can see there's a diagram behind me there. It's not the greatest because it's the best one I could find though. This is what loomed high above the Israelites as they looked to take the city. Humanly speaking, there is no way in the world that this fledgling nation could get into the stronghold of Jericho. It was impossible. It was inconceivable that they would ever even get through those walls. Now, you can call me crazy. But are there not times we have issues, we have problems, we have challenges in our lives that seem to look as impossible to deal with as the walls of Jericho? And I'm thinking that there are, for each of us, those kinds of problems. Now, it also might not be a problem. It could be a calling on our lives. Or it could be an opportunity that we see. But it actually happening is as likely as taking down the walls of Jericho. So the Jewish nation had crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And I want to pick up the story in Joshua 5.13. And you might wonder where Joshua's head and heart was at, because he's just taken over for Moses and was now the leader of this nation. And as he looked over this vast number of people in their 12 camps and all the fighting men that he commanded, do you think he may have had a moment when he thought, oh, this, this is as terrifying as it is awesome that I'm in charge. And then he spots a rogue soldier who has a sword out. And he thinks, hey, I didn't tell him to do that or go there. I'm supposed to be in charge. Who is this person? And over he goes as the commander in chief of this buddy nation. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So this moment is a moment of commissioning of sorts. Now you may notice some similarities from Moses and the burning bush. But this is a wonderful reminder that Joshua is not in charge. God is. And Joshua responds in the best way possible as he humbles himself with great devotion and he hits the dirt. The reverence and humility Joshua shows is actually beautiful. And he had an excellent example in Moses. But he's also a man who at this stage in his life, his body is full of strength. His mind is as sharp as it can be as a military strategist. And still, Joshua, the warrior, realizes his need for the Lord. And let me mention, this may well be one of those moments that Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. And Joshua, with no questions asked, does what the Lord asked of him. And the Lord did something for the people as he gave them the plan to literally take down the city. And it was crazy from a human perspective. Let me read this to you. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Beep, 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 back up the truck here. That hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened. But the Lord, 
He says the evidence of it being a done deal is that the city is on lockdown and high alert. The sign is they are amped up and ready for battle. The proof is that Jericho is terrified of the Jewish people, even though they have all the military advantage and are in the most secure city of its time. It's a done deal, but it hasn't happened yet. But it seems that Joshua and the people have something that those in Jericho do not. Here comes the plan. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priest blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. Okay. This has got to be the strangest battle plan of any battle plan ever made. Circle around the city day in and day out for six days. On the seventh day, go around the city seven times and then all give a loud shout and those walls are done for. They will come crashing down. If you were Joshua, do you think you would have had a few questions? about what the Lord was telling you to do? Like, how is that supposed to work? Lord, how is it supposed to work? And what did it require of the people? And, and I know that you can kind of see it behind me on the screen. They were to do what was asked of them. Or you might say, trust and obey trust and obey, that they would take the time and the trouble to march around the city for six days and then seven times on the seventh day. And they did just that. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and they took the city. Okay, the Lord God, the Lord God did all the heavy lifting to bring down those walls. God did it as the people followed his lead. So what does this story have to do with prayer? Well, there, there are so many wonderful principles in this story, but for this morning, let me just ask, what is your Jericho? What is your Jericho? And I have no doubt that for some of you, even me mentioning that, it just pops into your head. I mean, if you have cancer, your Jericho could well be the healing you're seeking. If you're younger and you may have learning issues, your Jericho may well be a degree. And that was me going to Bible college. If your marriage is blowing up, it could well be reconciliation. And the same might be true if you're estranged from your adult children. For some of you, you're drowning under all the money that you owe. And your Jericho is freedom from debt. And then there are those who may say that their Jericho is the godly spouse that they are looking for. Someone who loves the Lord Jesus, is living their life on purpose. You want to find someone like that. Where are they? And then, and I need you to stick with me here, and then there are some of you here this morning, and you're moving through life, and it's not with a great deal of satisfaction or contentment. And maybe you need to ask, what is it that you want the Lord to do for you? What is it that you want the Lord to do for you? Because it is important to be specific. Uh, let me give you an example, and we're going to jump into the New Testament at the same location, Jericho, but this is with Jesus. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. 
But they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Okay, these were two bold men. And Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Okay, kind of seems like a silly question, doesn't it? They're blind. But it seems really important to Jesus that they are specific. And they are. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. I mean, if any of us were blind, we would have asked for the exact same thing, that we might see. But do we see? Do we see what our Jericho is? Do we see what it is that is standing in the way of us entering into the life Jesus has for us? What is barring the path of you coming into the promised land of living in the favor of God for you? This sermon was entitled Prayer. And simply put, prayer is speaking to and listening to God. And one of the most heartbreaking things in life as a Christian are the prayers that go unanswered because, because they were never prayed. Never asked of from God. If you do not pray it, God will not do it. Let me just make sure you hear that again. If you do not pray it, God will not do it. And some of you have the biggest dreams for your life. And you see massive opportunities that are before you, and they are exciting, but they're also scary. And you have never included God. You've never involved Jesus. You've never embraced the wisdom that comes with asking the Holy Spirit for guidance. And those challenges, those dreams, those opportunities (laughs) that are presented right before you, might as well be a Jericho barring your way to the promised land. Daniel Henderson put it this way, prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. Let me say that again. Prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. And rather than abiding in the Lord and going forward, we shrink back. Because there is no way humanly possible to take down Jericho. And so we shrink back. And we shrink back. And we live a life of apathy. Of just kind of going through the motions. Never experiencing the life that the Lord God has for us. Do you want to unleash the power of God in your life? Then ask God to unleash his power in your life. Remember last week we talked about the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit lives in you as a Christian. Remember two weeks ago, Benaiah, Benaiah, who chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day? Crazy man, right? No, he knew his Lord, and that his God was far bigger than a lion. And he relied on him. And Jericho. Okay, really? There is no way the Israelites should have gotten in. But they did. They circled that city 13 times. And the walls came tumbling down. And God did that. God did that. Is there something that you need to circle again and again and again and again in prayer? Because when you do, you will be coming to the Lord. You will be connecting with him. You will be in his presence. And the Lord can work within your life as you wait on him. Wait on the Lord. Oh, that sounds kind of like a real old-fashioned saying. But it simply means to spend time in the presence of God. And while you're there, you circle that prayer request. You circle it again and again. 
The presence of God is a powerful place to be. Many years ago now, I had uh, rededicated my life to the Lord, and I knew that God had called me into ministry. And I was on a youth retreat at Camp Iowa, and one of my fellow students, a guy by the name of Alan McLean, had a prayer meeting on a Saturday afternoon during free time. And what you might be thinking, what teenager would go to a prayer meeting on a retreat midday during free time when there was like so much other stuff to do? Well, there was a bunch of us who came together and we were going to be praying for each other. And as we came together, the presence of God fell on us. And it was the most horrible, wonderful thing that had happened to me up to that point in my life. I knew, I knew that God was holy. I grew up in church. I, was, I grew up saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And for my 17-year-old self, I thought I had a pretty good understanding of all that being holy meant until the weight of Yahweh's holiness fell on me. And I was broken <laughs> very quickly. I was broken by the weight of my sin. I, I was broken. I, I couldn't stop crying. This was, and this was no whimper. This was ugly cry. Ugly cry. My lust as a teen. My taking advantage of my parents' trust in me. I mean, it was like every sin that I had in my life was suddenly magnified in those moments in contrast to how holy, holy, holy God is and how holy I was not. I don't know how long it went on, but it was not pretty. And here's the thing. Every single one of us in that room was crying every single one of us, except Al. Al, who was moving from person to person with the love and care of Jesus. And I moved from horrible to the wonderful because God did not leave me broken and he won't leave any of us broken. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he was. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And he did. The Holy Spirit was speaking and reminding me of scriptures I knew in my heart. That I was loved. That, that my sin had been removed from me as far as the east is from the west. That I was a child of God. Jesus' chosen friend. Oh my goodness, it was so good. And I still couldn't stop crying. I mean, I was a snotty mess. But now I was overwhelmed by God's love for me. And it happened at a prayer meeting during a youth retreat on a Saturday afternoon. God showed up. It was a day that I realized how deeply dependent I was on God. I am on God. And that was okay. Because hear me, it's supposed to be that way. And all those promises that are in the Bible were for me. And all those promises that are in the Bible are for you. And we need to take time. We need to circle them. We need to claim them. Because all of God's promises are yes and amen. Yes, they are for you. And I don't ever want to do life independent from God. Because I want the power of the Holy Spirit in the presence of Jesus as I do life in the favor of my Heavenly Father. And I know I am not the only one who wants that in this room today, who feels that way. So hear me. If you do life that way, you will circle your Jericho in prayer again and again and again. And you will be specific about what you want the Lord to do for you. And you keep praying. 
and you declare your dependence on God. But hang on as the walls come down to his glory. The Lord will change you through prayer. He will change you through prayer. The Lord will change the world around you through prayer. To God be the glory, great things he has done and will do. But we have to pray. We have to pray. And let me be clear here. Why we pray specifically. Because when you pray specifically and God answers, he is more glorified because of the fact you're like, he did what I asked him to do. Whoa. And you're overwhelmed by the fact that you begin to realize in ever-increasing ways you have a father in heaven who loves you that much. I encourage you as a church family so often to read your Bibles. And I, I, I'll do it again today because we need to know what God is saying to us. And maybe you need to read your Bible with a pencil in your hand and start circling those promises that are for you. Israel defeating Jericho and entering the promised land was a promise fulfilled to Moses some 400 plus years before. Okay, let me, let me give you the takeaway on that. God's promises don't have a shelf life. They are good to go. Claim them. Claim them from Scripture. Be in God's presence. Come to him and circle the Jericho that is barring your way into the life God wants for you. Circle it and don't stop. Keep coming back. Circle it again. Pray specifically and watch what God will do in your life and through your life for his glory. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for the, the Bible that you've given us to encourage our hearts, to build us up, to challenge us. And God, I pray this morning that my friends would have a sense of a renewed desire to spend time with you in prayer. God, that they would come and, and do everything they can to, to get rid of the distractions and spend time with you. Lord God, would you come and speak to them? Would they be able to hear you? Would they sense your presence, Lord, as they spend that time with you one-on-one? -on -one? And God, I pray that you would be glorified in ever-increasing ways here at Bramley Alliance Church. As we pray specific prayers, Lord, of what we want to see happen in this coming year for your glory. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the fact that we can take down the walls of Jericho, those very things that bar us from entering into a relationship that we can have with you and all the things that come with it, Father God. May we be a people of prayer for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, if you need someone to pray with you today, we will have our prayer team. They are already, some of them are already up here. More are probably coming. And if you need prayer, come and get prayed for. I want to remind you that tonight, 7 o'clock, over in the welcome hall, we are gathering for a time of prayer. And it's going to be low-key. It's not going to be band and singing and uh, there might be there will be some worship but it will be low-key and we are going to come together and we are going to seek God's face first before we ever go after his hand we're going to seek his face that we might know him in a better way a closer way so I encourage you if you want to come you're more than welcome and uh, it's seven o'clock over in the welcome hall this morning for our benediction, it is simply this from Colossians 4.2. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. <coughs> and I love the fact that it says be watchful. Watch what God 
will do when you pray. We need to be a praying people, personally and corporately. We are released.